Welcome, everyone. <laughs> to the hour two sets of yeah, see, You know what that is? You know what that is? That's an admir thinking about the pun for the episode. I already know it. I already know it. <laughs> there is no pun. We're late to recording. We're reviewing mm. Bahubali 2, Go. the conclusion. Everyone who's been clamoring, clamoring for this review. Yeah, we see it's you. It's finally going to be out there. And we see you in the comments chatting to us where's the review just reaching out to it. someone listen to me <laughs> well we're here to lend a hand all right we're picking we're, you right up absolutely we're gonna get to all of those movies that everyone has recommended it's just in due time uh we're just three men at the end of the day we wish we had more time um but unfortunately life is life but anyway bahubali 2 the conclusion. We're gonna view that today. I got Osama with me. I got Fahad with me today. Hello, boys. Say say hi to everyone at home. Hey, everyone. I'd like Hello. to shout out my mom, Christine. <laughs> no, her, name, her name's not Christine. That's but, yeah. nuts. Yeah. Thanks for having us, man. Hey, anytime, man. <laughs> um, uh, we're we're if you're listening to us on Spotify uh, or Apple podcasts or stitcher or things like that wow. give us a review we appreciate it uh we're also on the youtube at the hour two cents pod uh, so go ahead and follow us there this video of course is on there right now so if you want to take a glimpse at us chatting it up you can find us there uh if you enjoy anything that we say remotely even one thing even one thing matter of fact even if you don't enjoy anything we say hit that like button <laughs> hit that subscribe button so you can uh, fight us in future reviews and argue against points we make and hit that uh, bell button so that you get notified exactly when this episode drops so you can hate in a timely fashion all right because, meet us where we can meet you because late hate <laughs> is really not the same it's not appropriate it's, guys it's Come not on. we appreciate when people chat to us the day after a review drops uh, <laughs> it means we have some dedicated haters uh and we, there's hate we etiquette those. to be honest with you and some, some of y'all some of y'all just don't get it i don't know what to say <laughs> you hate in weeks after the review you gotta hate like within <laughs> the first week anyway uh we appreciate of course everybody for subscribing to, to the channel of course uh we've had a couple comments recently come in uh osama we'll go to we'll go to you on your comment corner to highlight yes. one of them Yes, sir. Thanks. I'm in my corner right now. Uh, this week, we're going to shout out a, uh, a solid comment from a longtime listener and recent watcher who goes by the name of King Fadal. He commented on our Bodies, Bodies, Bodies spoiler movie review. And he said, shout out Admir. There you go. A little nice little shout out for you. I watched this because of you. Had a blast with my boys at an 1130 showtime. I'm giving it an 8.2 because it was just fun. And I love the ending. Like you guys said, the movie had satire, but it can still be enjoyed as a normal horror movie. Performances were all surprisingly very good. Careful that shot in to, the car. Careful not to spoil ah, the movie. <laughs> excellent point. And see, this is why you're our fearless leader, my friend. Because I was about to drop the entire, <laughs> the entire <laughs> spoiler in that one comment. Listen, if you guys haven't watched that review yet, I don't know what you're doing. I mean, you probably yeah. didn't watch it because you probably didn't get a chance to watch the early release of the film. So, True. to be honest, True. quite quite respectable. But go out there and watch Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Excellent movie. And you can mm -hmm. check out our review on every platform that Admir mentioned. Back to you, Admir. Thank you, Osama. And just for the record, I don't make bad recommendations. <laughs> Moving on here. That's right, Fadal. Uh, Stop commenting, dog. <laughs> I oh, appreciate the love. I always appreciate the love. Um, Fahad, we're going to go to you now. The correspondent who can make the least amount of mistakes on this plot summary reading. Hopefully, because uh, you're going to give us a little crazy. bit of a background. <laughs> I think you did a great job. CBH. Stretch out, stretch out. <laughs> man's got the what is it? The uh, Birdman, the, the Birdman hands, man. The Birdman hands. I'm going in. <laughs> he's ready to. He's ready to go. Uh, Fahad's going to run us down through the plot of Bahubali Two. Then we're going to get into the hour two cents segment. Uh, we got three topics. Uh, we're we'll running them down really quickly now in case you want to fast forward through the episode a little bit. So firstly, we're going to talk about the structure of the two films, uh, a little bit of back and forth that happens in the plot. Uh, secondly, we're going to talk about what we liked, maybe didn't like about this one compared to the first one. And then lastly, just a general, I, I guess, conversation almost about did we feel satisfied uh, at the conclusion of this story of, of, of this plot here? Uh, so Fahad, please uh, take it away, sir. Perfect, perfect. Uh, this is a bit long, just like the movie, so uh, bear with me. All right. Uh, Katapa... <laughs> this guy's laughing already. Uh, Katapa continues to narrate how he ended up killing Amarendra Bahubali, 
After vanquishing the Kalakeyas, Amarendra Bahubali is declared as the future king of Mahishmati and Balaldev its commander-in-chief. The Rajmata Shivgami orders Amarendra to tour the kingdom and its neighborhood along with Katapa. During the tour, Amarendra witnesses an attack by Dev Sena and Tev Senai, the princess of Kuntal, a kingdom neighboring Mahishmati. Falling in love with her, he approaches her after the fight, posing as a simpleton and an orphan, and Katapa plays a role as his uncle and is accepted into the royal palace for a job. Balaldev receives a message of Amarendra's act, and upon viewing Dev Sena's portrait, lusts for her. He asks Shivgami for Devsena's hand in marriage. The Rajmata, who was unaware of Amarendra's feelings for Devsena, assures Balaldev and sends an emissary to Kuntal, who delivers the marriage proposal in a patronizing way. An insulted Devsena rejects the proposal with a scathing reply. Enraged hearing her response, Shivgami sends an order to Amarendra that Devsena be brought to Mahishmati as a captive. Meanwhile, Kuntal is attacked by Pindari's uh, da Daku-like army, basically like robbers. Amarendra, with the help of Katapa, uh, Devsena's maternal cousin, Kumar Verma, is able to nullify the attack and save Kuntal. Upon being questioned, Amarendra reveals his true identity. He receives a bird post from Mahishmati, ordering him to take Devsena as captive. He promises Devsena that he will protect her honor and convinces her to come with him to Mahishmati as his future bride. Upon reaching Mahishmati, the misunderstanding is brought to light, and when an ultimatum is delivered to Amarendra that he must either choose the throne or Devsena, he chooses the latter. Balaldev is crowned king, and Amarendra is made the new commander-in-chief. This, however, does not impact Amarendra's popularity among the people. During Dev Sena's baby shower, Balaldev rids Amarendra of his duties as a gift, quote-unquote gift, and offers them to Setu Pati. Dev Sena speaks out against Shivgami's inaction and taunts Balaldev. Due to further clashes and altercation between Dev Sena and Setu Pati, Amarendra and Dev Sena are banished from the royal palace, living, hap living happily among the people. Bejaldev convinces Kumar Verma that Balaldev is after Amarendra's life and he must kill the king to safeguard his brother-in-law. Kumar Verma enters the palace in the stealth of the night, not only to be discovered by Balaldev and be killed, but not before revealing their plot to convince Shivgami to kill Amarendra due to the people's continuing respect for him. Shivgami convinced that Balaldev's life is under threat, but that open hostility would result in civil war, orders Katapa to assassinate Amarendra. Katapa, bound by his word to serve the queen, lures Amarendra by feigning he is in trouble and then stabs him in the back and kills him. After Amarendra, Amarendra's death, Katapa soon learns of Balaldev's treachery and informs Shivgami who reveals to the panicked hordes outside her palace that Amarendra is dead and that the baby Mahendra Bahubali would ascend the throne. As Balaldev and his men are about to seize the queen, she flees with the new king, but falls into a river after being hit by an arrow shot by Balaldev. Balaldev becomes a tyrannical emperor who holds Devsena prisoner for the next 25 years and destroys Kunto. Mahendra ends up in alliance with the rebels who try to rescue her. After listening to the whole story, Mahendra Bahubali, alias Shivdu slash Shiv, immediately declares war. He uh, assembles the rebel army. Alias, I'm fucking done, man. He assembles the <laughs> rebel. He assembles the rebel army, consisting of villagers and scattered soldiers. With Katapas and Avantika's assistance, the army lays siege to Mahishmati. Balaldev recaptures Devsena, but Katapa, Mahendra, and the rebels breach the city walls and save her. Mahendra fights his uncle and pins him down using the chains from Devsena's cage. After completing a cleansing ritual, Devsena burns Balaldev on a pyre, ending his reign permanently. The next day, Mahendra is crowned as the new king of Mahishmati with Avantika as his queen. W's in the chat. He declares Mahishmati will be dedicated to upholding peace and justice under his leadership. He also orders his men to toss the head of Balaldev's statue out of the palace walls where it is swept to the great waterfall. It breaks as it falls and crashes against the cliff's walls and lands near the lingam that Mahendra carried earlier in Bahubali 1. That is the conclusion of Bahubali 2, the conclusion.
Ah. <laughs> That's great. Yo. Nice for that. Elias, nice for man. That. I'm done here, bro. Uh, Elias Bureau, bro. Elias. Stead, Stead, it's always Stead the level two words. Bro, like, why are you doing this to me? You. I'm already spelling some <laughs> next level shit, like, in, on my head, and you're giving me. Yeah, okay. But we got through it. You said you said Elias, and I remember reading this somewhere. I'm like, Elias? Who's Elias in the story? Like, and oh, then you oh, no, I, was, I was reading along. I had to do a double take. I was like, wait, <laughs> Did I miss a line? <laughs> But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but no, cool. appreciate it, Father. Thank you very of much course. for that. Yeah, that, that's actually quite lengthy, and it's 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 a bit of an intricate plot, which we'll we'll get into actually with our first uh, topic here. Uh, if you haven't listened to us before or watched the show, the hour two cent segment's pretty straightforward. I'll make a topic or statement or question, something like that. Um, that's a little bit spicy, uh, and our gents here will either have to give said statement, question, topic, uh, one cent, meaning they disagree with it, or two cents, meaning they agree with it. Uh, the idea here is to have no middle ground because it's 2022. Uh, first statement is that the structure of the two films hinders uh, the overall plot, and I will go to Osama for this one. Thank you. I feel like you always go to Fahad first. I was a bit surprised at this one over here. Tossing I grenades. You mulling it over in your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, of course, naturally, I got the, the hardest opener to the two cents segment here. Ever. Yeah, so uh, a little bit on the, the structure of the two films. So we were briefly talking about it uh, a bit before the podcast, which I know whenever we mention that on this, on this podcast, it's never helpful to anyone because you're not involved in those conversations, and we're here to talk about them right now. Um, the structure was interesting. We talked about this in the first review of the film, where we end on the plot twist. We end on this idea that Katapa killed um, Amarendra Bahubali, right? And that um, we're essentially going to be taking ba taken back through time to figure out what had happened in history and what led us to Mahendra Bahubali's existence right now and what he's meant to be doing. Initially, I felt like there was so much in the first movie that I couldn't really... Uh, there was so much in the first movie and yet so little of the story felt like it was told because we got to this point where by the end of the first movie, a few of us, main, mainly probably myself, was a little bit disappointed with the amount of resolution we got in the first film. After having learned that that first film is a part of the dual film structure, very similar to the three from Lord of the Rings and how they were shot concurrently, they were shot together and they were... And this one, I think, was meant to originally be one super long film that ended up being two. That eased a little bit of that tension. Going into this movie, I was like, okay, we're going to start with this, you know, flashback. How is this going to, you know, feed the structure? How is this going to improve on the previous movie? I felt like going into this one, the story became a lot more linear, going back in time and then leading us towards where eventually we knew we, were, we would have to land in present day. I thought it was really cool for... Um, that to be the crux of the entire film, which is that knowing that this entire film has already happened, knowing that we've been given the ending, ironically, in the movie title, The Beginning, and now in the conclusion film, we would be taken through the beginning. Um, I thought that was quite ironic, quite interesting, and, and, a, and a cool ploy to take us through something now that we're extra, extra. Because I think with a story that's net new like this one, you need to develop a reason for the audience to watch it. And I think by giving us the ending and giving us that plot twist by the end of the first one, there's a lot of reason for me to be curious going into this film. That's all to say that I felt like the structure did benefit this film in a way. However, there were areas where I felt that it was lacking a little bit. At times, because of the nature of the actors being cast multiple times um, with both the protagonist yeah, I think with the protagonist basically playing both himself and his father, it was a bit confusing at times um, throughout this movie, trying to figure out, you know, is he playing his father still? Are we still in the flashback? I'm glad that the film didn't use film tropes like taking us back in time in grayscale or having this like kind of mirage version of uh, this dreamlike sake that was, that was the previous time period. But I think... It wasn't up until towards the middle uh, act of the film when I really got really fully understood where we are situated in time um, because of the fact that both Katapa and Bahubali are together in both modern, I guess, present day where the father is dead as well as previous time um, where uh, the father isn't dead. Um, there was a little bit of confusion over what the relationship is, how this is going, etc. And so I think that was easily remedied, but didn't help this the, the like for me to feel i guess 
grounded within the movie at all. I think the pacing was a lot better than the first film as a result of taking this approach, really setting up the um, the ending in the first film allowed me to just like kind of ease into knowing how this is going to end in this movie. And as a result, kind of figuring out the pacing on my own without the movie going into it. But the movie did tackle a lot. And so between it tackling so much, uh, the recurring cast members and the fact that it's it's kind of hard to tell, you know, what, what how we're going to land to the future state. I was finding myself a little bit confused, but overall, this was a much better structure to me than the previous film. And so as a result, I'm going to give it a, a solid two cents. Fad, going over to you, what did you think about it? Yeah, I thought like the way they ended the first one, we kind of penned it for almost like I think me and you liked that thing. Admir didn't like it, but both me and you were also like, we definitely see where Admir's coming from, and we don't disagree very strongly where it almost felt like kind of cheap because you knew that he didn't do it because he's this evil person. There's someone else behind him, and you want me to watch the movie because of that. But then when you realize that they were both made in the same kind of time frame in terms of like he shot the whole film at once, and then he cut it up into two basically at any point, and he decided that was the middle point. Uh, I was I was pretty fond of the le, le, uh, second movie in terms of the way it explains why a lot of things are the way they are. Because the first one, you're just like, yo, like, why is Paladev the way he is? Like, there's mad things happening in the first one that you don't really know. But the second one keeps things less complicated and basically almost t- tries to untie as many knots as possible that it has created from the first film. And... At least, in my opinion, I think by the end, it manages to do a lot and tells a lot of, gives you a lot of answers. Like you said, you have a lot of questions after the first one. I think this one gives you a lot of answers, but I do agree with you in terms of like, there are some difficulties with casting the same character, same person for him and his dad. And there's a bunch of, there's a bit of time jumping in the movie. Like, I was kind of telling you guys off screen, like, the way I was kind of grounding myself into the movie is looking at Dave Sena, like, if she was looking mad young and, like, princess-like, because she always seems to be around whenever he is around. Mm -hmm. The moment he kind of branches out after the war, she's around from then. And I definitely kind of, uh, this kind of goes into the second part of the two cents, but uh, definitely love the way they tackled Dave Sena's character. And you can tell that even though the movies are two, like, shot at the same time, the, he has a larger vision in mind, and it's not very linear in terms of the way he thinks about certain demographics or certain people. There's multi-layered people across both movies now that he has been able to show. Uh, all that to say, yeah, two cents for me. Uh, Admin, what did you think? You hated it. I can tell by your face, man. Yeah, it's done. It's done. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah. The, so, two it, yeah, it's not a, it's, it's not a hate at all, uh, guy. But I, the thing, so I, I drew it out, like I, I drew it out, because th- there's something where I felt about the end. We'll, we'll talk about the end, um, down the, down the road. But there's something about spending a good portion of the movie with, um, the son. Then in that same movie, you go back. Then in the second movie, you're still in the past basically up until the final 30 minutes or so and then you come back to the sun i think in terms of does the plot make sense does it work sort of on paper i think yes um because of everything you guys said where we need to sort of go back and understand some of the motivations of some of the characters here uh especially um his uncle uh Balaldev, like why is he the way he is right a lot of these guys tend to be sort of uh just evil for the sake of evil or you hear about some of the mistreatment they maybe had growing up but it was i think relevant to see them two growing up as as um him and and uh mahendra right no uh aramendra uh, growing up yeah growing up and and seeing how that played out so i think it's relevant with that the thing, why why it ends up being a one cent for me is by the time we go back to uh, current day, mm-hmm. it's been so long that I almost don't care about the sun anymore. 
I'm now f I'm only fully invested in uh, Aramendra's journey and him dying, right? Because that has now taken up so much of the screen time. And I right. think so much of my emotional connection was with him because of what went down as opposed to his son. I've seen this movie compared to The Lion King quite a bit, and you can see it. It's very Shakespearean, right? Mm -hmm. um, it would be like if I'm watching The Lion King and... After, you know, uh, we start with like Simba running away with like Timon and Pumbaa and shit, they cut and then you see a background with Mufasa and Scar for like a good chunk of time and then you come back to like Simba and then you finish from there. So it, the I don't know what the answer is. Like I haven't thought enough about it to say where maybe the cut would be a little bit better, but I think the structure of it lets down uh the son's storyline in favor mm. of the father so i don't know if that's intentional to say that the focus is about um aramendra bahubali if that's really the core story um but it, it does seem weird to me that that takes up so much time like the reason i loved it in the first movie is because we got two-thirds of it uh about uh, Aramendra and sort of his journey up to that point of almost realization essentially and then you get enough flashback where you're like okay cool I can see what's happening here mm -hmm. but when so much of the second movie was I think in the past and we watched them pretty close to each other so I almost can't imagine watching these like sort of a year or so apart right I think they were a couple of years apart right it just seems like by the time I got to the end of it I, I really didn't feel super invested in in the Sun story arc at that point I almost felt like the hero of the story was the father in a way. And, I, and I, I get that the ending, of course, puts both of them in really good light. But I do feel like it's a little bit too much time spent in the past. So the structure for me, unfortunately, does get a, a one cent because of that feeling a bit disjointed to me. I think what helped me with that comment was that, yeah, or that realization is that, the because I felt the same way, the first, like the first movie... Halfway through the film, everyone's recognizing him as his father. Um, he has like the early stage of the film is really identifying himself, discovering himself, what he likes to do, being rebellious, etc. There's clearly some grandiose yeah. vision for this character. But then in this movie, it made it very clear that they're kind of played by the same actor because he's basically a reincarnation of his father. Fair like enough. he Fair is enough. Yeah. a the reason I think they focus so much on his father is because his father is this basically saint like um character for mm -hmm. their entire um i don't even know what you would call it their kingdom their entire kingdom yeah. and because of that he was viewed as the second coming of him essentially because of how gracious and kind and respectable he was and true, so true. he like it was like for some reason portrayed in the first movie that he like carried on all of the same exact characteristics as his father which is mm -hmm. why i guess there's less of a need to flesh out his character knowing that he's basically the copy he's the descendant that's gonna do the exact same things but to your point like that makes a lot of the the stuff in the first film just have so much less weight to it yeah no i think you're making a great point by the way i think if you view it from that angle and i don't know what the sort of i'm sure there's an angle you can tackle it from that angle of is 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 there the theme of reincarnation here of him living? And I think that comes up several times where Bilal Delph talks about we haven't heard his name in like mm -hmm. X amount of years when he's talking to Def Sana while she's chained, I think, in the first or the second movie, something like that. So I know that's sort of mentioned here and there. And you're right, maybe it is. Maybe it is meant to be the same right. character who's inhabiting the values coming back. Um, that's a fair point. I don't know. I'd have to really think about that again because that is a very, very fair point. Um, but I guess just to keep it interesting, I'll, I'll stick with the negative. And everybody take can those, bash me. We take me, those. Can Five out of six, we move. We move. <laughs> can bash <laughs> me in the comments. Uh, so I guess this isn't a, a two cents, but um, uh, what did you feel this movie maybe, one thing this movie did better, and, and one thing that maybe the previous movie uh, did better? So one where they maybe... Uh, it's really good and then one aspect that maybe faltered a little bit uh, Fahad I'll go to you for this one first uh, I thought that in terms of kind of showing the romantic interest develop this movie had a much better kind of route to kind of doing that okay. and also I love the kind of action sequences with him and Dave Sena like mm -hmm. taking on the robbers like you don't really get that scene with 
Bahubali and Avantika, even at the end of the movie, like they're not taking on dudes together. And even in yeah. the moment, he's showing her like new skills. Although she's like the best archer in her land, he's showing her how to do new stuff. So I definitely love that angle of the movie. Another thing, I also I you, I know you said one thing, but I did love that the queen got way more coverage in this movie because that actress is like really talented in terms of being able to kind of command a scene. And I love that she actually got multiple kind of heavy, heavy scenes in this movie, which we didn't really get to see in the first one. In terms of, uh, what was the other one? I have to give something bad from this movie too? Yes. Maybe something that the first movie did better than this one. Okay. Uh, I would say first movie did so, I, the first movie I guess lined up like uh, Sam just talked about it, it kind of lines up the sun story very well you care about the sun's outline what's happening with him whereas this one doesn't really do that a lot but uh, in terms of action sequences like I thought this one had potentially better ac action sequences too than the first one All, and also this one had more like ingenuity in battle than the first one there's multiple instances of them kind of being creative, whereas in the first one they have like just the, the carpet thing that they do, but uh, not the carpet, like the tent where he t ties like mad cl right, clots right. together and he lights them up. Whereas this one is very kind of cool in the way they do the, the, all where they almost get into like turtle shape and they have the soldiers kind of catapult into the castle and they're like, oh shit, his mom's in the, his his yeah his mom's in there. He has to go save her. See, I, I almost thought his wife is in there because it's the same guy. See, like, that, that that's the shit we're talking about. But yeah, so he does. And also, I love the use of the kind of cows to uh, flood the dudes. And cows have extra significance in Indian culture. So the fact that he's able to leverage that and still have the farmers who actually have a very key role in Indian society play a role in doing that. So that was kind of cool. I, th I thought that the second movie did that, like, much better than the first one. Uh, what do you think, Sam? Yeah, I agree with everything you mentioned. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna hone in on, I think there's quite a few things, quite a few strengths that each of the films had, but I'm going to hone in on one thing, which I think was the biggest differentiator between the two, and that is in this film, I felt like the motivations were very strong. I knew where the direction of the story was going because I was able to lean in on the backstory from the first film. I felt like one of the biggest detractors, like I mentioned in the first film, we talked about it in our, in our last review, is that it felt like Lord of the Rings 1, where a lot of characters are just doing a bunch of things for seemingly no purposeful reason. Um, I think back on the scenes of Bahubali just climbing a mountain and then having some dance sequences with um, Avantika, I think her name is, and like just the, all the different things that we talked about so much in the first movie that... I realize have very little meaningful, um, you know, weight in this movie. But I think we're good enough in terms of setting, I guess, the backstory. What I think the first movie did really well is give us the colorful nature in between the moments to understand the personalities of these characters. So I think the way it was set out was the first movie, very similar to Lord of the Rings 1 in, in, in a kind of way, is introduce these characters have them doing different activities because in the process you get to learn a little bit more about who they are why they behave the way they are what is this person's relationship with his mom what is her relationship with her kingdom what is his relationship with his father and his quest to um take over his pursuit of just pure um power etc and then in this film we got a lot of that action that we were missing in the first one yeah, I know you mentioned Defy, but this film was really that culmination that I guess that Helm's Deep kind of version of Lord of the Rings where you're really getting nonstop fight scenes, big action sequences, a really extended like 30 minute war scene by the end of the film. And so I feel like all of the the emotions kind of came together to a weighted culmination when it came to the action. So in this film, I think the biggest strength is in, in, in motivated action. So really, I, th I think nothing happened in this film where I was really confused as to why this person is doing this or why they're behaving that way. Um, I think uh, I, I start to think about characters like, you know, Amarendra Bahubali and, and why he's so kind and gracious, etc. is because he was raised so virtuously by his mother who was chosen to be the queen of this kingdom for those reasons. Whereas Baladev is 
he's raised by this guy who's also power hungry. He's because he's very much trying to, I guess, ascend the throne of his sister. And so that'll naturally be passed on to his son. I think that re- translates to why Devasena has like this chip on her shoulder of, you know, really coming from her own kingdom as a princess, holding her own weight to, and really being the strong female character that we were kind of craving in the first film, coming here and kind of really being the catalyst for this entire plot um, in this movie. And you get to see like the, the dual side of nature of all the characters. You see Katapa not just as like a servant slave, like not just as someone who's gonna follow orders no matter what, but as a well-rounded character. You see Sivagami as a well-rounded character. She's not just always doing what's virtuous. She does the most heinous thing, which is ultimately commission the murder of her own son. And so you're gonna see all these characters that are like multifaceted now because of the fact that they have motivated actions because of the fact that this movie leaned on all of the kind of lesser, more unmotivated actions of the first film that was meant to really be the color commentary around who these characters are. So I think the first film did really a really good job of kind of establishing character arcs and their motivations. The second movie did a good job on acting on those motivations. And both of those, I think, were the biggest weaknesses of, of those respective films in the reverse. What did you think, Admir? Yeah, that's a really good point. You got me thinking about something that uh, I wanted to mention as sort of what I thought this movie didn't do too hot. But b- before I get to that, I want to talk about what I think I really loved about this one uh, way more than the first movie. So I mentioned the plot structure is a little bit, for me, um, a little bit too expanded in the past. The thing that I love about that, though, is you're able to get this um, insight into the political landscape of this mm-hmm. kingdom. And you get this very, I'm going to compare it to Game of Thrones because that's always the thing that sticks in my head. Like the first season of Game of Thrones level of political sort of chess match thing, right? Between Balaldev and uh, his his brother uh, Amarendra, right? And so you get this, um, you know, there's a little bit of confusion. There's a little bit of conniving. There's a little bit of like... We're going to set a trap here. We're going to set a trap there. Are people going to walk into it? Mm-hmm. And so there is this, there's, I think, more uh, more at stake throughout the course of this movie than I think the first one. I think the first one, as you mentioned, you spend a lot of that time almost just enjoying the world. At least I did quite a bit and enjoying a young Mahendra, sort of just exploring himself and growing up. Um, it's... It reminds me a lot of like the first Dragon Ball when they don't kind of do anything. They're just messing <laughs> around and then shit starts happening in Dragon Ball Z. But yeah. <laughs> it's sort of similar <laughs> here, right? Like there's actually important things like kingdom wide happening throughout the mm-hmm. course of this movie. And a lot of it is very meticulous. And I think that maybe shows the strength of the plot here compared to the strength of the first movie, which the first movie is a little bit more linear. It's easier to follow. And I think. It may be a little bit more entertaining, but I think here you maybe give away some of that fun aspect to it, at least, you know, before sort of the, the, the major action sequences in favor of something a little bit more uh, complex, a little bit more nuanced, a little bit more about what it's like to actually have these tensions revolve around the ruling family and the consequences of that when one of those members will almost do anything really or anything to ascend that throne. It's nothing new. Like, again, I mentioned this is similar to a lot of sort of, you know, the Shakespearean texts, and we've seen it in other movies again. But I think the way it happened here, it's, it's in a unique enough way, and I think it's in a very um, clear way. Like, I didn't ever get lost as to, oh, who's doing what and mm-hmm. what's the plan here? Because sometimes it's easy to fall into that trap of twist, 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 twist. And you're like, okay, now I don't know where we're at, right? But f- right. really from start to finish, uh, it was great to follow it along. The thing where I sort of, I mean, I I had this as a negative, but you mentioned it, and I'm I'm going back and forth, and I don't know if it's a negative or not, or what I think the first movie did a little bit better than the second one. I think this second movie had the potential to be a lot more uh, uh, heavy with the consequences. So there's two instances um, that I, well, there's there's one instance that that I think really speaks to me, and that's sort of... Um, with Bahubali continually siding with his wife over his mother and the kingdom. I think, and I, look, I'm not a historian, so I, don't, I, I can't speak to what these consequences should be, 
but I remember watching the movie and he does this several times. Like he speaks out against his mother, the queen and the kingdom several times. And the consequences just don't seem to have the weight that I thought they would have. Right. Mm -hmm. You have the first one where he loses his crown. But then he still ends up being the leader of the military and he's really the de facto leader because the people still love him. So you ask yourself, yes, he stands up for his sort of wife and it's supposed to be a very dramatic and heavy moment. And I think it was when it plays out. But a part of me is like, well, what are the sort of the consequences of this move? Right. Happens again and he ends up being banished from the kingdom. But then it's fine again because he's with the people and they love him and nothing like mm -hmm. bad is happening because of him choosing to constantly defend his wife, which I think is very nice to see nice. in a very crystal clear way. Like him being right. like, nope, like I'm going to stand by my woman. You heard that? Everyone stand by <laughs> Stand by your woman, man. Yeah, and so it was great not a to see. Podcast of Andrew Tate sympathizers on here. <laughs> it's blue pill. This is a blue pill podcast. <laughs> uh, so it's it, it was great to see that. Now, where I sort of have a hesitancy to put too much sort of negativity on this is the fact that he ends up paying with his life at the end of the movie. I mm. just wish it wasn't like this in one fell swoop, dramatic. Okay, now we have to kill him sort of thing. I did feel by the time we got to that point, it was a little bit obvious in a way. And I think it lost some of the maybe um, cleverness that the rest of the movie had to get to that point where we're now going to kill him. Um, I thought it was a little bit too easy to getting to that point, considering everything else had been sort of laid out pretty neatly in the movie. Um, and then again, the one for me that carries over from the first movie... Uh, Katapa doesn't have a moral question on his hands. So him killing um, uh, Amarendra, I don't think there's any consequences from it. I think there's the internal guilt, but there's no real consequences of it. And there's a sense of him having washed away that guilt by helping his son reclaim the kingdom. So it's sort of, it's almost too clean to me um, that some of the decisions that these characters make are really big and they really don't lead to the negative impacts I sort of was maybe hoping or imagine those impacts would have. They felt a little bit too uh, limited in, in terms mm -hmm. of what could potentially go wrong. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm sort of going back and forth on that, but there was a couple yeah. moments like that where I was like, oh, that's kind of oh, only that a sort of, oh, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. But yeah, I don't know. I would I love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Because, yeah. Yeah. I have a few thoughts on those. So I, I get what you're saying, Admir, in terms of, because I felt that at times as well. I think there was this big crescendo moment, this really big slap in the face of Bahubali for the first time, really um, saying no to his mother. And like you said, siding with seemingly in her eyes this woman who he just met right and yeah. i think there's a few cultural elements to to add in here so one i think when amarendra bahubali promises himself to devasena mm -hmm. that is basically in 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 the culture like a moment where you're like now committing yourself to right. this wife beyond everything else like this is a commitment for life and he even i think verbally says he's committing to her mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. if it means his life and yep. so from that moment on, I think it's expected that he's going to take that approach. I think it's also respected by the court and his mother that as being her husband, he has to take her side in this situation. Mm -hmm. But because the mother's the queen, it adds this obviously weird element where you're now uh, disagreeing with the queen. In the, in the process, I think there's, they, they go to good lengths, and I think the actress is really great, where... She is showing how conflicted she is with this process. The fact right. that she wants to the mother, disown, yeah. yeah, the mother. She wants to disown this guy who she knows is the best suited guy to lead the kingdom, and also knows that he's technically making the right decision by siding with his wife, mm -hmm. because she admits to her, herself like that guy might definitely be guilty, the one who basically tried to lay his hands on Devasena. So she's saying like any, she kind of understands from her perspective, anybody would kill this man if they found out that he was trying to touch their wife. So yeah. I guess she understands it, but in front of the people, she can't be weak by allowing him to disobey her orders. And so that's mm -hmm. why I think he ends up getting the result of, you know, losing his stature as the, as, as the upcoming king and becoming 
uh, the next in command, I guess, to Baladev in that situation. So I kind of understood the downgrade in, in position there. And I also mm-hmm. think from a ca- from a very caste based society, you can't take someone. You could even look at England for examples of this, but you can't take someone from the royal family and drop them very low. And mm-hmm. with all with all things considered, the lowest they can drop is still a very high position in the court. Right. But it's a big, very very big decision to make him. Uh, uh, drop from being the next king, essentially, and so I think, I think the real issue is in how Bahubali himself responds to that, which I think made it feel a little bit like it didn't matter. Where he's like, "Oh, yes, sounds great. I'm down for that. Cool." Like he, there was no real moment right. of him feeling sad about it, and I think that was because of the fact that he never truly desired power in that kind mm-hmm. of way. He was even okay with his brother initially being the king. He was surprised that his mother selected him. I think that part wasn't shown so well in the movie, which is why it led multiple of us to feel like there was really no weight behind this decision. It's like he was cool with it anyway. I think after that, this decision to banish him from the royal family came after like, I forgot which argument it was. Um, I think it was after he cuts that dude's head off. He cuts that dude's yeah. head off for yeah. touching her in the middle of the, the court. advisor's head or whatever. Is that the when he's banished? Head. I thought yeah, he was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he, loses, he, was banished he, only when he loses the seat for saying, I'm not going to give him up for Palal Dev. So that's when he becomes mm-hmm. the general. And then the second time, he, while the herring is going on, I think that dude says something weird. He says something out of line. No, no, it's it's because... No, I thought the second time was when she, he didn't want to... She chops his head off. She, she, he she, chops his uh, head off. Devsena, Devsena chops the guy's hand off because he's about to touch her. And she mm-hmm. gets imprisoned. Oh, for some he reason, I thought that was the first time that he lost no, no, no. Uh, status, and then the second was no. during the baby shower, or is that the nah. reverse? The baby shower, no, he doesn't even say shower. anything. He's just quiet. It's no, no, his the, wife talking shit. The baby shower yeah. is when Balaldev takes away the, the power of the military and gives it to the advisor, who Bahubali right, ends right, up right, right, right. beheading. But he still hasn't kicked scene. him out yet. He's just like, you got no yeah. job right now as a dad. You're right. You're right, you're right. I have it in reverse. Stay at home. Stay at home, dad. Type shit. Um, the 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 reverse of whatever I just said. So yes. whatever first session, second session, yes. losing his ability to uh, be this like general of the military and ending up with the people is another situation where I think to him, yes, it's like the warranted. I think that's also a big consequence for someone in the royal family to be completely disowned by that royal right. family. Like when you've been considered basically a god by people, and now you're um, at the stature of like the common folk. And I think. To him, he's this pretty much like almost purely altruistic character where being within common folk, yeah. being within everybody else is kind of a, a happy, pleasant sign to him. And I think was also a call back to how Mahendra is like with his people in his town before he even shows up at Magismati in the, at the kingdom, when he's with his people, like just carrying everything, caring for his mom, no matter what, like all the same exact characteristics just mirrored between father and son. I think when it came to the consequences, like that felt like the natural occurrence. It's like a lot loftier than we expect because we don't live in a monarchical system like that. But I think in a system like that, that those are really hefty consequences. Similarly for, similarly for Katapa, I know like, I think the, the, the big setup with him is that he is a moral, seemingly just person at his heart, like with like deep down. And that's why for him and even the queen, to a certain extent, the biggest travesty they could face, both of them being set up as these really, you know, all knowing, wise, like supreme kind of characters, the biggest punishment they can have is this internal torment over making the wrong decision i think maybe bigger than anything a court could pass down but at the same time he receives it purely as a result of him actually following royal orders so technically like from a legal standpoint from a logistical standpoint he shouldn't have been punished but that's why i think it was interesting because they give his character this burden of knowing that this guy who he treated as his son who he loved dearly and was forced to kill. And mind you, he initially refused to kill him. He even right. disobeyed the court, which right. is something that his whole lineage is is not meant to do. It reminded me kind of of uh, the the Ackermans in in Attack Attack on Titan and how they're just meant to like kind of like uh, serve yeah. militaristically. But um, he refused and only did it still out of love for the queen because she said, "I'll do it. Like I'll do it myself." Essentially, if right. you don't do it, and so they kind of forced his hand into doing it. Like he's he's so 
loyal and respectful to such a degree that he's like, if this guy's going to die, I would rather it be dying at the hands of someone yeah. like me who is not related to him than, than his own mother. And so I think that's why the biggest like punishment he could possibly receive there is knowing that he killed this man unjustly, essentially. Do you feel like, and this is for both of you, I guess, based on what you said. I, I agree with what you said. Mm-hmm. Um, do you feel like Bahubali, both incarnations, we'll call it, do you think he's too perfect of a character then? Because I struggle to find a flaw here. Because mm-hmm. if his actions are always perfect, if his consequences don't hurt him, if he's in a way immortal because his son came back and you know he he took control over where is the flaw sort of where is the weakness what is the character arc of our main protagonist here you want to take it fight or i can go yeah you can go first i'll go i'll go after you can go ahead yeah i think i think you're you're spot on Admir. i think he is the more i was talking about it the more i realized he's like this flawless character in a lot of ways i think the one flaw that really showed up throughout the films but didn't really provide any consequences is that he's he's so loving that he's gullible to an extent and as right. a result like that's kind of like how people capture him or how he might lose it in a fight to Avantika etc like there's like it happens in these like very silly that's moments. some that's some shit like on uh, on an interview what's your weakness I just love too much <laughs> yeah. I just work too hard I just exactly. work too hard man <laughs> but it's like but those kind of characters you're like if you're super loyal super respectful right. like you do everything by the book your weakness has got to be that you're unwilling to go to a certain extent to achieve what you want. So there's like unwillingness to like cross the line, which he does with yeah. his own mother, which he does with Balal Dev. Even people like outwardly, um, you know, kind of hurt him, etc. He still doesn't cross the line in, in his retaliation. Obviously, there's a lot of murder and all this stuff. And we could talk about like, you know, how, how moral <laughs> like sure. death, like killing is. But um I wish I saw more of him being vulnerable as a result of being so gullible, but we didn't get too much of that. It only happens in really silly moments where he's yeah. play fighting or where he's yeah. like, you know, just like messing around with Katapa or whatever else it is. Like we don't get those moments, but I do think on the other hand, I think the film knows that his purpose is to be this godlike character. And so as a result, they're okay with him being absolutely flawless. I think I would appreciate it a little bit more if he wasn't. That way I could at least like feel some form of relatability to it and also feel like there's weight behind his actions because I know at the end of the day, he's going to come out of this relatively scot-free. He still dies, but relatively, right. you know, his reputation is untarnished. Like I think he that's doesn't why I make wish- a mistake essentially. Exactly, like and I, that's why I wish. Movies, yeah. One of the coolest parts of this film was when um, Baladev's father—I forgot his name—when um, he kind of betrays um, Devasena's brother, I believe. I forgot her. I forgot yeah. his name yeah. as well. Yeah, Kumar but Varma, yeah. That, yeah, Kumar Varma, and when when he like kind of basically uh, overhears Baladev and his father talking about their uh, plot to kill. Uh, Bahubali, and then he goes to. I, I guess like the red flags were blaring in the back of my head, but when he's talking to the father, the father was so convincing. I think in the acting, yeah. props to the to the to the actor, they're so convincing in the fact that he's realizing that his son is going too far. I'm like, there's no way they're gonna take this approach with the movie. And then the whole kind of uh, the little plot twist there when he enters the room to try to murder Balal Dev and, and, and ends up getting ambushed essentially while they're killing all the guards around him. Like This really cool like foiling of the plot and you get this real moment where you're turning full on villain. I thought that kind of should have happened. That was like a more just death for Bahubali, I think. Like that was such a significant moment for uh, yeah. um, Kumar Varma, is that his name? Yeah. And Because um, and he wants I to do like, the right thing essentially. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. exactly. And yeah. I think that would have been dope if it was Bahubali because it would have shown that his his foil was the fact that he's too gullible and loving of his brother and his uncle and his mother, etc. But instead he gets this like really, and it might be like just the intention of the movie, but he gets this really, you know, uh, I guess romanticized Viking-esque death in battle that is like de- is more deserved for his character, but less so of a realistic expectation of someone who's so seemingly perfect. Yeah. Fahad, I don't know if you want to add there. Yeah, no, uh, 
one thing I would say is kind of like this goes back to the idea of like reincarnation where like the idea is the whatever then this is me boiling it down to the most simplest version of it it's like whatever vibes you're putting out there that's how you're basically gonna come back like if you're a good person <laughs> if you consistently Karma. keep being a good yeah. person when you die you're not gonna like come back as a dog like you'll be rewarded with another like mm -hmm. better almost reincarnation so his son to a level is almost better than him because he can i mean uh I, I was watching the second one with my mom like i said she also ruined the second one for me too by the way just like the first <laughs> one so but, w. but but like when he gets sent to like with to live with the people this dude's on like some leonardo da vinci shit he's like inventing shit i think he invents the <laughs> wheel or something like he's doing crazy shit so i i don't know if that's like a kind of cultural thing to show like oh this guy can almost like a superhero level of like powers isn't he like which it his does show is like shiva or yeah like, almost right. yes yes yeah yeah and and he also shows like superhuman strength so the way i see it is almost it's almost like a superhero movie where like the main protagonist doesn't have like one of his biggest flaws is probably like he's a man of his word like some some insane shit like that like i'm loyal to my wife like that's his big right, flaw right. in like our culture so Amen, it's some, something bro. like I'm willing to give up every seed in the kingdom for this woman. And then we're going to go live as like peasants and I'll, I'll still be inventing shit and making something of it. So I don't know if the movie is trying to send a message that if you like mm -hmm. stick to your guns or if you do X, it'll come back. But uh, I do agree with you. There is a sense of almost like kind of like, I guess, difficulty relating to him because I don't think there's a single moment in the movie where he has a remotely bad thought like except for like killing enemy soldiers but like he's not like how are you how do you how have you never wanted to take your cousin out of the equation when you could easily you take him off the table you take charge this woman isn't going to stop you he never even remotely uh, like even his wife doesn't suggest it at no point as mad as she is she's like why don't you just cap these two everyone loves you anyways you can take over when you talk about game of thrones he's he's ned exactly Exa yeah he could be but that's the thing i mean i guess but he ned dies. suffers yeah so like exactly you like but, you right, can't right. live in that world right and i think well this is just season one of Bahu Bahu, right? <laughs> yeah that's a, and, and <laughs> the thing is they kind of use the death as this is his big suffering moment i feel like right. what yeah, you're talking about yeah. is as like shitty as that sounds you would have wanted to see him like suffer a little bit more or at least be at least like him question his niceness like yeah. at no point in the, in the movie for me is like <laughs> yeah this is not like i'm it's saying nice, nice like in the actual way that i'm trying to use the word not our way the way <laughs> like as like, like the good in his heart he never really yeah. questions itself for me like even as you're getting invaded by like outsiders even as you're even as you're having to like kind of you're seeing your mother being dragged away in like a horse carriage yeah. he gets mad he gets very creative in the way he goes about the siege now but at no point is he like i'm gonna like just burn the city down and have no like some daenerys shit like i'm, I'm not gonna have any regrets so yeah i do see that is a flaw but like it does so well in terms of kind of like masking it with all the other shit that's going on i feel like it overcomes that like it's not a fatal flaw for me like i don't think it's like I needed to see him fuck, kind of like go through something or maybe it's because I've watched like so many Bollywood movies and I'm kind of like just happy that this movie is doing a lot of things that other Bollywood movies don't, don't do and that might have been one risk too far culturally to take to have almost a guy who has like a god's name as his nickname is going to start moving a little bit weird. I don't know how like culturally that goes, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, you can, it, it doesn't, for me, there's nothing like quote unquote wrong with it. There's no, it's opinions. This is yeah, an opinion right, right. thing. Yeah. My thing is like, I, I try to sit there and I think about like other characters who are like close to being perfect in like movies that I've seen. Like Superman's an easy one, right? Superman's always depicted as like this powerful blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But even in like Man of Steel, for example, not a perfect movie by any chance, but at least Superman yo, has Zach some sort Snyder. of arc of like, yo, yeah, guy, always. Yo. The boy, haven't name dropped him in a minute. <laughs> But, like, in that movie, for example, and I've seen it one time ages ago, my recollection of it was, like, oh, coming to grips with who you are, being different from others, what does that mean, and understanding the limits of your, like, strength and power and things like that, and there being consequences because of it, right? I guess There's we several... only get that, sorry yeah. to interrupt, go ahead, go ahead, we only yeah. get that for Mahendra in the first movie, where he's, like, kind of, he feels 
like an outsider in his village where he's like these people are all doing stuff that i like would rather be doing more i'd rather be climbing mountains and picking up huge rocks and right like leaving this town for something more grand in my head i think that's true in my head though there's there's no the, the lack of the flaw the reason i think i harp on it i'm harping on it a bit right now is is because that's usually the thing that gets amended by the end of the movie and so you right, sit there right. and you go okay so the character started being x and now he's mm -hmm. y right both of them there's really don't a really change there's no yeah. lesson yeah there's there's lessons for the audience to learn, but the mm -hmm. character doesn't learn anything, right? And I, I have this like thing where if characters sort of plot along like that, I I don't need to relate to Bahubali, right? But I think it adds to the the film if your character has a flaw, that's the flaw that's targeted, and that's sort of the thing that he ends up having to maybe overcome by the end of the movie. Whereas again, that that's sort of it, it's missing here. I didn't I didn't know while I was watching it, that was maybe something I, I thought about. But mm -hmm. I think during the course of this conversation, solid point. I guess that came up. But yeah, everyone, thank you. No, that was really nice, and that was very not planned, by the way. Not planned, folks. Very spontaneous. <laughs> uh, real quick, our third, um, our third, uh, our two cents here. I'll end on this uh, on on the comment that the uh, Bahu Bali movies one and two are a very satisfactory pair. Uh, when watched back to back, and I'll go to Fahad for this one first. One or two cents. Ah, uh, back to back to back as in as you mean the way the they were it was yeah released. like together yeah, yeah. they work and it's a yeah. satisfactory. I I, I do think this is one of those kind of uh, sequels where you could also watch it in reverse and it would also pretty much make sense to you either way, right? <laughs> so uh, overall, like kind of no matter what order you kind of watch it on, I was definitely satisfied with the way the saga kind of ends and how they are not trying to build a larger Bahubali universe at the uh, end of the movie. How they... It's it's good to see very, very large-scale movies come to uh, almost... Ending that, yeah, you're expecting, but it's an ending where they're not trying to sell you any extra shit. Like... This yeah. is it. This is the story I'm telling. This is the end of the story. And I thought, like, like I kind of mentioned earlier, the fight sequences from the whole end of the movie. And when she's, like, doing the walk with, like, the fire on her head. And he's, like, fighting in the background. And throughout the fight, yeah, you know he's going to win. Obviously, he's going to win. Like, Balaldev has no shot. Fight, but Balaldev, like, like, his weapons are kind of creative. Like he, he's, he, like, he has some cool sequences when he fights. They're talking back and forth. So uh, I, I definitely thought it was a kind of satisfying sequel. I can definitely see why the second one did the numbers it did in the uh, in Bollywood in terms of box office. I think it's the highest, right, Sam? I think it's the highest uh, uh, grossing film in uh, Indian cinema. Let me fact check while you go. I know that it's 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 one two three between this one and the first one and. Uh, KGF. So I don't know what order, but I, I think that this one actually did insane numbers when it came out because of kind so of I like... I think this is number two. This is number two. Dangal is number one. Oh, that's actually a uh, new movie. Oh, that's kind of like new. Well, like actually, recently. Dangal, I think is 2016. Like 2016. Yeah, someone... One of my yeah. co-workers, funnily enough, just showed me this the other day. She's like, oh, I watched it. One of my favorite actors is on it. So, maybe so yeah, that, that one grossed 2,024 crore or okay. 311 million dollars. Okay. Bahubali oh. 2 pulled in 278 mil. 270. Yeah, so 278 mil and that's massive. That's massive for mm -hmm. Bollywood. And also Huge. the budget for this movie was not that crazy still. So uh, I, I definitely thought that they kind of leveraged cultural tropes, but also went outside of them in certain instances. E even the kind of elaborate set pieces is going outside almost regular. Indie. Like it's not mm -hmm. only focusing on like the one character one v oneing the whole army by itself. There's a larger kind of play happening, right? Yeah. And also like the super creative weapons too. No, I definitely thought it was satisfying. Uh, what do you think, Sam? So two cents. Two yes. cents. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Shit. Yeah. One cent. Oh, I, I was satisfied, but it's a one cent. No, it's a two cent. I gotta give Chris that cue to <laughs> drop that ka-ching. <laughs> now, for me, yeah, for me, I'm gonna have to agree. The I, I touched on it a little bit earlier, so I won't go too in depth on it right now. But the I feel like these two films complemented each other in, in very puzzle pieces like manner. Um, I think, like I mentioned, the first one 
all of the weaknesses of the first one just so happen to be the strengths of the second movie. Um, the second movie, like I mentioned, really leans into the action, leans into the motivated uh, motivated actions of each of the characters. The first one was really the back the backstory, the emotional foundations of this entire story, giving me a reason for why I should care about the story. And then the second one is really giving me that story playing out like a Shakespearean uh, tragedy or drama, as Admir mentioned, and so for me, if, for that from that perspective, I don't think any one of them could exist in isolation. So I think the two as a pair really work really well as a tandem. So it's a solid, solid two cents for me, and I'm actually really glad that we wrapped up this chapter of Bahubali because I, I solidly enjoyed it. What about you, Admir? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think um, together the story from start to finish, um, even with the way sort of. Maybe I, I thought it could have been a little bit different told spliced wise, but it, it's it's a very f- fun movie. And I think that's really key here. Like, mm-hmm. again, we, we talked about this with, um, I think, Lord of the Rings and RRR to some degree. But like epic films in the 2020s are rare in even the 2010s. Like, I remember back when I didn't watch movies like this. I remember like Troy came out. I remember like mm-hmm. Gladiator came out. You have these movies that come out and um, they're they huge. Go. Like they're massive set pieces. Yeah, Osama's favorite movie, right? They're like, they, they, they're, they're emotional. Top they, five, top five. <laughs> top five. They're, they're these huge films. And I think like we get long movies nowadays we don't necessarily get the epics i think that maybe at least Mm -hmm. western media used to create so it's great to see that this is something that is happening in spades uh in tollywood and in bollywood and i think it's it's just fun to be on these adventures on these long adventures without it being seven eight movies Mm -hmm. or without it being a tv show without with it being like it's two movies it's six hours that's it right and so I, I so love like that. a season if you were to watch a season in a row yeah like just six hours of content i think i haven't seen it i think you both have so check me on that but would you consider interstellar an epic a space epic yeah i think mm-hmm. we've definitely seen space epics i think uh like star wars could probably fall into that mm-hmm. category i just off the top of my head i could be wrong i'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure i'm not 100 percent accurate too on many. It, but yeah it's just in my head it just seems to be like such an old school thing you know like i've seen in recent times i'm talking about three or four past years like the longest movie that comes to head for me is the irishman but that's not an epic that's yeah. just it's a really long movie told over a long <laughs> span of time right and that's different than an epic right and so you have these movies and we talked about Raja Muli a lot in the first Bahubali and in, in, in RRR it's great to see him uh, leaning on of course his own culture and of course the uh, perhaps the religious foundation to build these characters build these stories for audiences that haven't been used to it so I, I loved it and I'm not giving credit for the sake of him being different but he mm-hmm. did it well and I think that's what's really important here. Did it really well. A part of me wants to rewatch it with things in chronological order. I think there maybe is something to be gained from having that different perspective. Uh, not to say that I think it might be better, but I would just, it would maybe give me a, a different opinion about the way Raja Muli decided to tell the story if I see it maybe linearly. Maybe things are lost, maybe dramatic moments are lost. When you tell yeah. the story in that fashion, I'm sure someone's chopped it up on Reddit somewhere where it's all linear. It probably exists. Uh, but for me, it is a solid two cents. And, uh, the thing, one thing also, uh, I'm going to throw this out there. That boat sail scene when they're dancing and singing and all that shit. Yeah. Outrageously fantastic, by the way. So Super good. cool. I loved it because it's like fantastical in a closed moment. So it almost doesn't matter that it's fantastical. And, uh, it's like a mini music video in the middle of it. Yeah, <laughs> it's just in the middle of it. It was, it was so fun. I wrote it down. I couldn't introduce it at any other point during my comments, so I thought I'd <laughs> throw it all the way at the end. Um, but, yeah, anything else before we go into scores here, boys? Yeah, I mean, there's, like, I think it would be remiss to just mention, like, the, 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 the scope and the, yeah. I think, the grandiosity that i think this film undertakes like yeah. especially the second one the amount of massive scale fight scenes the amount of vfx the amount of just like action that the like the relentless action that the actors have to go through i have so much respect for 
the actors, the director, all the filmmakers involved in, in, in this film after watching it. And I think to your point, like the best way to describe it is just end to end fun. It gives you like yeah. that Mad Max, just nonstop action feel throughout the entire film. And I definitely felt it here in this like really closed off desert like kingdom scenario where he's just doing all these like massive, massive things. And then at what point do we start to question Roger Moly's relationship with like brotherhood and stuff like that? Because now this is Bahubali one and two and RRR where like the main story centers around these two guys who are seemingly like brother type figures, yeah. but are warring. Like, is everything all right back home with the, with the, with the kid, with the kid SS? I don't know, man. I think it's great when you can delve into uh, any artist's like entire backlog of art. You learn everything you need to know about them from the things that they make. I mean, we haven't touched on all his movies, obviously, but it, it's a really good point. There must be something that he sees interesting in telling mm -hmm. these stories about brothers or families or things like that. No, there's really a rare one, I'd say, especially out West. Like you don't get too many brotherly stories. It's always, you know, man, mm -hmm. woman or mm -hmm. uh, maybe even like parent and child stories, but n not really too many about this mm -hmm. duality mm -hmm. of two guys. Um, especially like, I think not to cheapen Hollywood more than it already is, but I think it's hard to sell a movie on the idea of just like, two guys going through war and love and friendship and whatever else like with each other and and i think these movies take that on really well i also feel like that's 100 percent a cultural thing too because we mm -hmm. all yeah. know or have people back home who you're like yo they're taking someone else's property over or like yo they're making a move on your shit so culturally <laughs> from our side of the world it's your family does that to you here it's like no one gives a shit your family is neither backing you or neither like it's it's kind of like uh, apathetic Individual. relationship yeah. back home it's like if you got ex uncle taking care of ex things he might not be acting in like full like his best year to, to yourself you know everybody got that uncle yeah man. everybody no 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 Yo, I'm just, man saying, just manage the property and that's cause, it because I know because I know you guys know you guys even if you don't have it yeah. I, I'm not saying I have them directly in my family but you hear of things like that from other people so that's 100% a cultural thing where it's like certain people when you put like a piece of bread in front of them they're gonna make a move and certain people right. won't and that's what all his <laughs> movies seem to like kind of emphasize like there's certain people who are gonna act a certain way when you give them incentives why other people won't and that's like the right, dichotomy so which one of the which one of the brothers on this podcast would be making that move none of us so because the three of us won't then that means in another room there's three dudes that will statistically yeah. so we're the good. caveat the caveat is we don't have youtube ads yet <laughs> oof, oof. wow so this dude said we'll y'all unpaid and y'all gonna stay unpaid right. quick quick i'm just quick saying check, it's easy it's easy to chat shit about Tiger Woods' morality when you don't have the same question <laughs> in your life. That's all I'm going to say. So I'm not in no Balal Dev situation. Right, right, right. Yeah, I don't quick, know how I'd act. To be honest, yeah. Quick I'm, check I'm, not, to, I'm not there for the throne either. So. Yeah. Let's, let's make sure Chris is listening to this edit. So Chris, put, 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 put your, put your, place your bet on which of us three would probably scam the other two when, when YouTube Steve, money comes fam. into the scene. Yeah, that's uh, good. Put it up on the screen. And if it's, if it's me, then... Tough luck. That's kind of crazy. Yo. He's going to put in all three of us, bro. I know, this <laughs> yeah. I know him. Uh, no, I think it's a really good point. And I, I, you see how he maybe uh, explores the theme of brotherhood uh, in this one with... They're not um, blood-related, correct? No, like adopted. They're, yeah, they're, adopted. He's they're like adopted, adopted brothers. But yeah. they're cousins. But they're cousins. Yeah. And, and you have it in RRR. It's two... Uh, friends who end up having this exactly. brotherly relationship. So, so you see him exploring it through different perspectives. Um, that's a really good question, Osama. I was trying to think through my head. In terms of like familial brother brother relationships, hilariously, stepbrothers come to mind. Yeah. Yeah. Bro, bro, <laughs> like, bro, five, brothers, five brothers with Mark Wahlberg? That's a, yeah, there's another one. There's nothing in terms of like epics or uh, like huge movies. Yeah. I mean, at least Tarantino's usually really good with these. Like in Once Upon mm -hmm. a Time in Hollywood, he has it with Brad Pitt and Leo's character, and then he has yeah. it also Very in sexist casting director. Yeah, yeah. I actually didn't uh, watch yeah, that. And, uh, yeah. You didn't watch Once Upon a Time? What you think? He does the same thing in Django. So he has Jamie Foxx's character with uh, Christopher Waltz's character. So they end up having this sort of. It's not a brotherly relationship, but like I would say. Maybe the guess. closest thing that I would, I would, 
whatever that is. But um, yeah, you're right. And maybe it is a little bit rare here. And it was, I think for me, it was the most refreshing when we watched RRR when it was like, oh yeah, it's just like, they're just friends with each other. That's mm-hmm. cool. That's I nice. love that like friend enemy dynamic. Yeah. Yes. Just take us back to take us back to Dragon Ball, man. W. <laughs> Vegeta's my king. That's, that's how we'll wrap this fight. Vegeta's my king, baby. It's streaming on Funimation. Uh, <laughs> all, all, all the seasons, so you can do that. Uh, When's no, the review yeah, coming no. out? It's a review of all of Dragon Ball. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so scores. Do you want to do scores? I'll go first because I think I'm a little bit low on this. Um, you boys did convince me to uh, increase it by 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 a bit here so i'm gonna go i think i went like 8.2 or 8.3 on the first one um this one i'm gonna go with like a 7.9 just a little bit shorter that 8.0 um so a great time with it but yeah 7.9 i'll go next i think i was surprisingly the lowest rater of the first film in the last episode i think our Listen, I'm just I'm the Metacritic of this podcast. We're gonna say I've inflated Crazy, scores. Um, I think the first one was in the mid sevens, which is really solid mm. movie. Maybe even late sevens. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and say this uh, film, Bahubali Two, is an eight point three. I think overall, it's like such a solid way to wrap um, this dual series. It gave us all of the emotional roller coaster of trying to figure out, you know, why this happened, how it happened. And it gave me so many ups and downs for the course of three hours yet again. So for that reason, I think it was just so enjoyable to sit down and just be thoroughly entertained from absolute beginning all the way to absolute end. And in the process, doing so in a beautifully visual way. Um, the acting was great. Directing was great as usual, as we're used to from the boy at this point. So for me, it's, it's going to be a solid 8.3. And I'm curious to hear what you'll give it five hilarious so we just flip-flopped wow yeah, yeah that's crazy uh I, I i i loved it i loved the movie i just wish my mother didn't ruin it for me that would it would have been kind of nice to watch it like without it being ruined on both movies but uh mm, but you'll I, always have the memory of watching, watching with, with your my mom. mom yeah we don't that really watch that many things that like true. that so we watched the second one together and she didn't disown you by the end of and it she so. didn't, yeah true. oh w, yeah w. yeah mm-hmm. like but also, she was asking crazy questions during the movies. Like, would you do this? I'm like, so bro. You, so you what disowned do you mean? her. Bro, like, wow. what do you mean, would you do this? We're broke. We have nothing. What are you going <laughs> to disown me from? Like, it's not like we got a kingdom that you're going to kick me out from. And also, the, I can't do this. And also, there's not, it's I've not like there's a line of girls outside that are here to play games with you that I need to choose. I hear otherwise. Over. That's crazy. Yeah, I, I, hear just gonna, I was just going to say, Madness. man. I hear otherwise. <laughs> Don't so, let these <laughs> viewers the, think otherwise. The, yeah. Leave in the comments below whether you think Fahad is a line of suitors outside his door (laughs) but i I loved it i i I, and i think it's very difficult to usually pair movies where both of them are on like a similar level if not one better than the other or whatever uh i love the kind of entertainment value of this movie and i think the both this one has more rewatch value imo than the first one the first one you need to be kind of into like a hero's journey type situation and this one mm-hmm. you can just put it on in the background there's just dudes doing crazy shit as, as, as you're like going on about your day <laughs> if you're working from home or if it's a holiday thing if you want to just throw it on with the family but uh, I'm going to give it an eight and a half uh, I, I don't even remember what I gave the first one but it might be the same exact score it's actually. just higher this is is it I, th- I it think I might have given 8.3 I think I might have given 8.3 for the first one I do think I do like this one a little bit more than the first one but I can 100% see why they would deviate. But on the other hand, all that says is like this dude's consistent the way he makes his movies. Because yeah. I think RRR also falls around this range for us too. I, I and But I will say now if we got to do the RRR uh, review now, you directly see how he has gotten better in terms of building these relationships, in terms of building these yeah, motivations mm-hmm. and the action sequences. So he's putting it all together. Uh, it's amazing to see this dude's journey across uh, three movies now. So uh, I loved it. It's an eight and a half for me. I'm glad we, you guys liked it. So it's, it, it, oh, it wasn't an absolute bomb. <sighs> Come on, bro. <laughs> Come on, this thing made like 300 we're million. Literally, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> we're yeah. literally watching minimum quarter <laughs> of a billion quarter movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so thank you. We got all the scores there. Uh, small note for the podcast moving forward. Um, Yo, that PSA, That sounds baby. crazy. That, that sounds, sounds like I'm OD. ending it. The way you said that <laughs> on the podcast moving yeah. forward. Small well, note <laughs> moving forward. Uh, None of us anybody who listened to this has to start reviewing movies yeah. for the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Because we're yeah. done. We need, we need y'all to come through. No, so here's what's happening. So uh, Game of Thrones uh, 
let me take that back house of dragons is coming out this week uh we'll be reviewing that the lord of the rings tv show is coming out september 2nd that's an interesting day uh is also coming out soon so we'll be reviewing <laughs> that his birthday guys wish him uh, a happy birthday in the comments when that review comes out i don't know we'll see we'll see we'll see we'll see we'll see, we'll see. um we then have other movies of course coming out so we're gonna try the absolutely outlandish stupid task of reviewing two Try. TV shows simultaneously as well as any movies we could pick up along the way. So uh, please obviously subscribe if you're interested to hear us chat about those things. Um, we're going to do our best to keep up with, with the schedules. Uh, we are three people. Maybe we'll call on to a fourth person. Maybe the wizard from behind the curtain mm. shall step mm. into the limelight once more. Who knows? We'll see. The wizard of Queens, uh, maybe. Yes. Stand up. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we have a packed schedule coming up for the next, for the next like eight or, or nine weeks or so. Yes. That'll bring us very healthily into the spooky season. So we'll pick and up Christmas. Mm. Then it's uh, Christmas. They're well. watching review then Halloween Christmas. all over again, baby. Halloween 17 review the season. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Eyes on the prize, boys. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's it's a packed schedule. I'm very excited for it. Um, so coming up next week, we're going to review Lord of the Rings. We're going to finish off the trilogy. Osama's going to be away, unfortunately, but he's going to watch along as well. Maybe he'll leave us a voice note about Actually, his thoughts I think, and feelings. Am I mistaken here? I think next week is. Uh, Game of Thrones first, review, and the following week is the House of Dragons. Lord of the Rings. Oh, fair enough, true. So yes. the first that so the first review back. of House of Dragons is going to be me and Fahad. So Osama won't be joining us for that, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but he will join us for the end of the trilogy, and then of course for the rest of the Lord of the Rings franchise uh, series as well. So lots coming up. We're going to do some uh, mixing and matching of people on the panel here, but it'll always be a good time. One, uh, there's one constant on this show, and is that and is the gonna vibes. Be a banger. That's the vibes we're trying to yes. put out, man. Good times. That's, <laughs> that's the vibes I'm trying to we put folk. out. There. <laughs> we have fun. <laughs> we have fun. That's the that's, vibes. A, that's a call back to the bodies, bodies, bodies <laughs> review. Yeah. And that's not a spoiler. Felt that's some not type a of way about out. saying that. I, I saw you yeah. look uncomfortable. <laughs> like they think now. This did you is guys? Who I am. Did you guys see the reflection of my girlfriend in my glasses? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, boys, really appreciate you uh, chatting about the movie. Such a good time. Hopefully everybody enjoys the review. Leave us uh, any comments where you agree, disagree. Subscribe, of course, to the channel. Reviews for the podcast help. Till next time, everyone. Peace.